Okay, before the break, we started looking at uh, the application of some of those things we were talking about the other day, physics, and uh, a lot of it's built into the game engine, but mostly we need a, we need a, a base understanding of physics for when things go wrong. We can use a lot of that. We put together a little thing before the break, and this was to show off how quick it is to make a 3D oh, 3D world in Godot. Get a character in there. If we had a nice character model in Blender, bring that in. It's super easy. Get them in there, move in really quick. And first thing we looked at was this default character script that Godot has, which um, is easy to work with. It's designed to just be a base level entry. We have better ways to move. When we control our power, we only control the acceleration. Right? The gas pedal and then the brake is also an acceleration, deceleration. So we speed up, we speed up or slow down. We're not having a constant speed and we're not moving. We're not teleporting to new locations every time. That's kind of what this script is set up as we're we're teleporting five pixels. Uh, its velocity. So we're suddenly moving at full velocity. Uh, we can do a little bit better than that. First thing I wanted to look at though is like our jump button is called UI accept. That's kind of a hard one to keep track of. Left, right, up, and down aren't bad, but I would much rather use the WASD keys than the arrows. Especially on the laptop because my arrows aren't even evenly spaced. The up and down, I'm um, on my current laptop, the up and down arrows are both shoved into the spot that should be just one button. I have I have other laptops where um, at least one all the arrows are a whole button, same size as all the other buttons instead of compress it. And I've had some 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 laptops where the up and down buttons are normal size for for that keyboard, and the left and right buttons are shoved into small spots. Yeah, all my arrows are off buttons, and my up and down are stacked on top of each other. My left and right have page up and page down as half buttons above them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so making keyboards shorter, sometimes uh, arrows can be a little bit uh, funny. So we can do it. <clears throat> and this is something we haven't seen yet. So if we go to project and project settings, and then all of our big game engines, not just the big three, probably the big Big 20, Big 25. This is some place we will go in basically every game we do. Every once in a while, you might do something small that doesn't require any configuration changes, but you'll pretty much always go to the settings for the game engine. So uh, that's one of the first buttons you'll want to find. You'll want to track down when you see a new game engine. Is where is the settings and configuration for this project? We're going to project settings. There's a lot of things here. General things, we're going to look at it slowly over time. Start with the second tab is input map. Go to that tab. There's this little switch here. If I click that, here's those that we're already using UI accept, UI select, cancel, focus next. So there's some built in there, but like our jump is on the UI accept button. That's not a useful name to keep track of. So what we're going to do is add a new one. You'll see this button here, add a new action. Actually, it's not a button, it's a text box. So we could add, like, say, a jump, jump button. Um, then forward, back, left, right. We're short on time today, so we'll probably want to do the all pitch and roll movement, but keep that forward, back, left, and right and just use different keys. This is something we have in all our game engines. We can code what it is. So if I go to that jump one, uh, notice there's a little plus sign over here. That's to add a new control to it. Um, and we have a lot of options. Well, first off, notice that this thing that looks like a search bar says it's listening. So you can just type something. So jump, I want the space bar, so I can just hit space. Uh, before I do that, though, 
scroll through here, look at some of the options. We can cancel and go right in. Uh, so we have the obvious keyboard buttons, expand that. All the buttons on the standard keyboard or the mouse. Probably want to use those in a few times so we can set those in there. Um, Joypad are your uh, your controllers. Uh, and you'll notice it's already set up for which button it is. So button zero, um, the bottom action button, the Sony cross button. Which one's the Sony cross button? The like your index finger? Sony cross, I think that's the, 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 the D-pad. Oh, okay. The T, you know, the up, down, left, yes. right arrows. So pretty sure. I appreciate sure that's what it is. It relates to the A button on the Xbox or the B button on the Nintendo. But we see which one it already is set to. And you can just choose it. Oh, no, no. Sony Cross is just an X button. Uh, oh, yeah. The X. Yeah. The, I guess they don't want to call it X. Triangle <laughs> and, yeah. I don't play PlayStation. I, I had to so think about that. <laughs> it makes sense, though, because, yeah, um, since their biggest competitor has X in the name, they don't want to call it the X button. Yeah. Oh, and circle, square, triangle, yeah. If I were to look a little further in the list, that makes a lot more sense. But you can see all those buttons are there, so maybe when we're jumping, yeah, we want the X button to be a jump if somebody plays this game with the, the PlayStation controller or the space bar. So I'm going to hit space, but um, one thing that it still throws me off, it's uh, so many times I've hit space and then went and hit enter, but look what, look what happens if we hit enter. Mm -hmm. It's listening for a key press. So it assumes we hit the wrong key the first time. So after you hit the button, you do have to use your mouse to click on the OK button. Um, maybe a right click. Um, also make right click. Is, so we can have lots of different ways to make our character jump. I'm going to hit close because there's no OK button or anything. It automatically makes the change. I'm going to hit close. So instead of UI accept, for that is action just pressed, I'm going to set to jump. So the name of the axis we've just created, those are called input axes, which is um, like an input dimension. Uh, it's an input dimension, but it has a bunch of values. It, it's not just one or zero. There, um, we have different values in between depending on the controller. It goes somewhere from negative one to positive one. On our keyboard, it accelerates very, very quickly. Right, like in, I'm talking five, six milliseconds, it goes from zero to one. But um, on your analog controller, you, had, you would have a lot, or analog stick, you would have a lot more control over that. But it's a number somewhere between negative one and positive one. Uh, we have action pressed and action just pressed. Just pressed will only detect it one time. So we can't just keep jumping. Actually, I'll show that. If I hit run, I'm on the PlayStation controller, but I can right click and jump from a right click. But if I keep right clicking, I think that one might show up on the camera, probably not. I'll probably hit the space bar and show up on the camera. If I keep hitting the space bar, it doesn't jump multiple times. But, so that's action just pressed. If I switch that to action underscore pressed, that will detect every, every time the button's pressed. So I do this and then spam the space bar. I was expecting multiple jumps. Uh, it has, it's also and is on the floor. Yeah, let me take this out. I'm going to hit undo and put that stuff back in there. <clears throat> and is on the floor is the big thing that stops you from double jumping. Yeah. So if I keep spamming the space bar, I'm jumping from the spot it was, it was at. And make sure it'll stop and come back down. If it was a rigid body, it probably would have bounced really, really high there. Uh, so play around with the rigid body more than the character body when we get to last time today because that's more relative to the laws of physics. I'm going to send a video that has uh, uh, 
have a video uh, of a pool game that uses laws of physics on spears. So it's a bunch of spears on a flat surface. So uh, the physics isn't super complicated, but it does get into it pretty good. And it's a fairly short video. Um, let me undo. Oh, wait. I'll keep that out of there and put it back into just. So just press means it's only going to happen once. So the is on floor is still missing. Actually, if it's if it isn't just pressed, if you just hold space, will it keep spamming? Is that the difference? Or no. um, yes, that holding is a great example because it's kind of hard to see the example. So it doesn't. I can't spam it the same. I guess we would need a side by side thing. When it was action pressed, it was going up pretty quick. But here, I can't. I can't hit it again until the previous jump is finished. So, but holding would work. If I hold it, it only does it once. And if I switch to pressed and hold it, it's going to work. So, this is exactly the sort of thing I was expecting y'all whenever we do the lab time. Do things like this, make little changes, see what happens. Change, see what happens. So let's see, is on floor and action just press. I'll go back to the basic one because that's a good jump. And I'm going to go to double jump. This one I'm just going to get rid of. This is this line and comment that out. Go to the end and add another line here. Um, I'm going to do this in. Notice they get some input vector from the WASD. I'm just going to listen for those directly. If um, input dot, same thing, uh, we just saw is action pressed. And this time use the forward. And I'm going to I want all four directions, right? So I'm just going to copy that code and paste that in. Nope, that didn't work. It's trying to end it. Sometimes IDEs do the auto end ending and stuff and get in the way of um, backward, left. Right, and here I will just set the uh, a value to one or zero. So jumping handles our y direction, so we don't need y. But uh, I create an x variable, the so floating point number equal to zero to start with, and a z variable again it's going to be a floating point number starts equal to zero. And if we push forward, which one do we need to increase? X or Y, or X or Z? Or should we go check? That's what I was, I was actually expecting that answer. And it's a lot to memorize. So, if, um, uh, focus on the character. Push F, and we can see that this is the positive Z. That's the negative Z. So Godot wants to use the positive Z as forward and the positive X. So if this is forward, then that would be left, right? So positive X is left, negative X is right, positive Z is forward. Negative these backwards. Do all the programs use the same color scheme? They always use the same color scheme. That um, that's an important one. That they always use the same color scheme: X, Y, Z, R, G, B. They go in that order. So blue is always Z. Blue is always Z. Green is always Y. That is very convenient. They do not always use the, the same directions. So mm -hmm. 
some engines negative Z is forward and in Blender negative Y is forward because our X Y is flat and the Blender has Z up. <clears throat> um, in Godot and Blender, notice how we go from positive X to positive Y, we're going in a counterclockwise direction. Y to Z in counterclockwise. From Z back to X, positives goes counterclockwise. That is also inconsistent. Some of our things go clockwise, some of them go counterclockwise. Some of them change clockwise between X and Y and counterclockwise between X and Z. Unity does that. Um, so you do have to pay close attention. It's not standard, but the color coding is standard. That's a great question. Uh, so forward will be positive Z. So we'll say Z equal to one. I'll just go ahead and jump all the way up. Uh, backward Z equals negative one. And also this is just like four numbers we're typing in, right? X equals one. X equals negative one. Also, you can just type in those four numbers and check and see which one, see which one it goes. And and then our direction here. So the basis is like those labels, right? I was just talking about arbitrary labels. Basis is however we reorient that label. So if our character turns 90 degrees, then or when our character was rolling down the hill, that's a better example. Rolling down the hill, the X and Y and Z axes are constantly changing relative for that character's thing, right? So every frame of the game, we need to recalculate what this character's X, Y, and Z positive value, positive and negative is. So that's what the basis is. That's how the labels for this particular object are currently set. And then we're going to multiply that by some vector, some three-dimensional vector. And well, Y is always zero because this is our forward, backward, left, and right movement. <clears throat> Jump is handled elsewhere. So I'm just going to take this out and use those X and Ys to that X and Z. That's part of the reason I don't like that. Those default labels use a Y for the Z value, so Y shows up twice, which makes it a little confusing. One of the reasons I don't like that. Especially because down the bottom it's velocity Z and direction Z and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting ready to change, going to change that. Well, I wanted to be finished with it in three minutes, so. Um, Oh, nothing's happening though. Any thoughts? Anybody notice a bug I might have left in there, skipped over something, moved on too quickly? Uh... Okay, I, I did. I do this periodically. I like to throw error. I like to kind of like throwing the errors. I like to throw error messages on days we're not super restricted on time, like today. Because there's a couple more things to talk about. We'll go over it, but um, I didn't throw an error, so I was like, uh, oh, the um, because I want to exit out that. Oh, you didn't. Oh, this is where it was, yeah. Oh, I thought because after we set the after we set the jump button, we didn't come back and do anything else, right? We went and ex did an example of it, but we never came back and set the other buttons. I thought it was, uh, I already did mine all while you're doing that. Yeah. That's why mine didn't throw an error. Oh, okay, <laughs> so uh, forward is probably W. Yeah. Backwards, probably S. I'm just pressing the key. You could choose it from a list. It's a lot easier to hit the key. Left and right. So left is probably A. And this one might be deceptive because, and then the D, but what do we mean by left and right? Is it our kick? In this case, our character is not turning. So do we use character left, character right? That's what I just did. What you but uh, should we use? The camera left and right. Usually, the camera is the thing about tagged onto your character, either in their head or behind them. So, usually, they're yeah. the same thing. Yeah, usually, they're the same. We will do that thing. <laughs> it's just that we're, we've just randomly slapped a camera to the. Mm. Yeah, this was just to get started so that there's enough to click around and be able to click around in. Here it comes. Backwards not working. I'm not sure why backwards isn't working. But the other directions work. Did I miss something there? 
you misspell backward in the code or in your uh, project? Project settings. Oh, I just did it back. Back. Did I call it backward or backwards? Oh, backward. So watch your little typos and things like that. Um, so this gives us some sort of direction. And notice then we just have an if. So um, if you haven't encountered it before, computers only check for explicitly false. Direction is not null, it's not empty. We did load something in there. Uh, or in other words, if we come back to zero, 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 right, if we're not pushing any buttons, our direction is going to be zero, 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 which will count as false in this case. Um, here we can make this a little bit more concise because we talked about vectors. So, because we have a direction that only has an x and a z value in it, normalized just gives it a length of one. <clears throat> so, right, in the vector quiz, we had that thing with the segment there, found the length of each vector. If we took it and divided it by that length, then our length would be one. So that really is just pointing in a different direction uh, in a single unit that's not going to affect multiplication. That's what normalized does. So we have that vector. So really, um, instead of doing this separately, we could just multiply velocity as a vector. But we should be changing velocity by, by our acceleration, right? So velocity doesn't just jump five pixels up. doesn't jump so much. Velocity slowly increases with every frame. Wouldn't that also have, sorry to kind of maybe if I cut this off the past, but something just kind of hurt me because we have the vector for direction being whatever X, Z, and zero. Wouldn't that mean that if you jump while moving, they would conflict with each other because you're... Oh. Yes, you, you Mid-air would just drop you to zero if you're trying to so do both. Another... Um, kind of, that's why they have it X velocity and Y and Z so velocity. So let's just make a Y, and we'll just set our Y to that gravity. So we're basically getting a, a one to negative one value there, getting something. Actually, it's not one or negative one. It's whatever gravity is set at and then the jump velocity, which we'll see before long. Then we can plug in Y. That's a great idea. So then our acceleration just becomes that direction. I think that will work. Um, so this is going to constantly accelerate. Oh, past three minutes. Oh, uh, we do have to... Sorry. Did y minus equals, so that's the same as y equals y minus something. So we need to do an initial set on y. Let's start it at 0, 0.0. And then there's a value in it so we can reassign it afterwards. There we go. Still fell down to the ground. I'm going to do this. Sorry. That was just a little typo. Velocity plus equals direction. I realized I just typed the plus sign. So I was going to talk about it. Because that's what an acceleration is, right? We have a number. Uh, if you think about how the car moves, you push the gas pedal further, then your speed increases. So we're just increasing and decreasing the speed as we push our ball. If we hit backwards, that's going to decrease our speed. If we hit forward, that's going to increase our speed. So it gets faster and faster and faster. But it's it starts from nothing, so that's way too much for speed. I don't know what was happening under the lake, but the character apparently moved way over to the left. Uh, on the terrain, probably. Or some funky drain. So that's way too fast, right? I might want to clamp. Uh, a clamp would be useful. Um, 
a simple if else statement, but really what it is, is we're probably thinking in seconds, right? For humans. We think in seconds, but do the computers process in seconds? We're going to frame by frame. So we're going to write a whole unit every frame of the game. But we're also not using the speed. Uh, yeah, I'm not using it at all, so I'm going to take that out. Oh, wait. Can't take it out yet. That will cause an error message. But we're moving a whole unit, and and every game engine will have this parameter in our loop. We always have that setup function, and then the the frame function that runs over and over and over again. This parameter is the length of time the last frame ran. So a scale factor, uh, a very small number, right? If that took, if the last frame ran in seven milliseconds, then this is. 0 0.007, and then we can multiply that big number we have times that and slow it down to a reasonable amount. So velocity times direction times that scale factor, delta. So now it it starts out very slow, but we can tell it's getting faster now. Yeah. A little more room. So it starts going very, very slow, but faster and faster and faster. So that might be too much. We might need another speed multiplier in there somewhere. Another scale factor, right? But we, we start by getting the frame going from seconds, like we think about it, down to the frame rate. And now we can multiply by speed. And this probably moves us a lot quicker. Uh, oh, capital letters. That one was built into the template. And whenever you do things like that, make sure you come over and hit the stop button. Okay, okay. Stop it, because you can't save or anything while the game's running. Then make the change and run it again. That seems a little bit better movement, like start walking. It does still have the same problem of uh, no upper rapidly limit. Rapidly going wee all the way up the map. Yeah, and an upper limit is easy. Uh, there's something called clamp built into every programming language, but it's a really easy thing. With, what's our top speed? So if um, velocity is gr greater than um, vector three of, I don't know, 10, 10, 10. There's more concise ways to put it. Then we'll do that. So we'll just put it at top speed. We're not going to pass 10, maybe in the jump direction. I just pick some random vector. As long as we're below that speed, this would be a place to check. Maybe if velocity x is less than 10, then we do that. And velocity dot z is less than 10. And then we'll let the y just be whatever it is. There's a, so now there's an upper limit. Oh, apparently. 10 is pretty high on the upper limit. But it, it is. Are you stopping or is the program stopping you? Oh, I stopped. Okay. I'll, I'll say when I let go. So let me go over here where there's not room to move. So start going. And I stopped. And notice what happened at the end there. It's, it slowly came back down to zero. Pretty quick. It feels like as soon as I let go of the key, but not in one frame. That's what I was trying to say the other day. It probably seemed over exaggerated when I was talking about it. But I was talking like five or six frames. So we're still only talking about a couple of milliseconds, right? But it doesn't uh, stop as soon as the instant we release the key. That way the player's intuition has to play in there some. So good movements like that. Um, and notice the S. The uh, 
The other one is using this move towards function, but if we're not pressing that key, then this becomes zero, zero, zero. So it should sl start slowing on its own. I'll leave that side, that other half for y'all to play around with and try to get used to some things. Um, you want to play around with it, make some changes, but try to turn it from that default, breaking it all down into this, to the base one component at a time to working with vectors, something like this. It'll be very, very similar to what we have. Curiosity, is there, but I, I give this is kind of like, you just want us to, to do it for, for doing it, so uh -huh. more or less, but is there actually a reason why you would do this for real? Or is this just kind of like a one, for, one method versus another? Oh, this would probably this would work better in most situations. The template is over is oversimplified for beginners, so it starts to the one met, could be one method versus the other. Our movement is not the same as what it was now, though, because before we just always we were jumping frames. Or jumping jumping positions, it was always going up or down by five, but now it's going up or down by every single number in between. So it smoothed it out. Thanks to the delta. Yes. Uh, oh, thanks for actually using the vector, the whole thing all at once. Hmm. Uh, delta times speed was still there. Speed is just making it happen quicker. This covers all the values in between. Instead of just jump, instead of just jumps, um, alternate styles we could go with that, but it's uh, the other style gets very complicated very quickly. It just looks better at the beginning, and we're always working in vectors. Everything applies multiple times, multiple at once. So. You could break it down. Yeah, you could. You could. Say, you could say it's just style. But when we change this one, uh, we hit all the value. We hit all of our direction now covers all the values in between, instead of just the next, the next click. If that makes sense. <laughs> but alternate style and the other style gets very complicated very quickly but it's set up to be easier for beginners. Easier for beginners, but there's pieces missing. I guess that's the way to think about it. But just kind of getting started on stuff so you can look at it. There's one tool you will need for the next project. We're going to come back and look at 3D games, and there's just a lot to them. So now it seemed like a good time to preview a lot of that stuff and start moving towards these things. Give you all some things to start looking around on. But one of the big things is your next project or your next homework assignment. So those first two homework assignments, again, were just oversimplified things. They were simple things to start messing with the game engine and the scripting language we're going to use get used to that stuff before we get to an actual game, which is what the next assignment is. Do I have it on this computer? Oh, yes, I have it on this computer. So something like this. Um, copying the first level of Mario, the original Super Mario Brothers, level 1-1 one, one from the 1986 version. Um, Make some sort of storyline, so change it up from the Mario story, so not a plumber rescuing the princess arbitrarily. Change your story up a little, but then make your world the same and try to get the basic movements. Oh, this might be an example. Um, notice how I'm, my movements here aren't quite the same as the original Mario movement, right? right? This is the movements in the template. Some things are a little bit off from the way Mario would have moved. 
Oh, there's a little bug. That's slightly different. <laughs> I was a heck of a thing. Not sure what happened there, but um, you landed on it, didn't kill it, and then it yeeted you into the air at Moss. Yeah, I have no idea what was going on there. That was just kind of odd. But he knows how it kind of it mimics that actual map and then changed it up a little. Mm -hmm. So just a couple boxes to use. Um, so I have to close this again. That's sort of the idea. I included a link to where you can find the map so you can follow the map, <laughs> make your images move back and forth. Let's create a new one called, um, I'm going to match the keyboard because I'm not going to get very far into this because uh, at this this was the thing that I didn't want to cancel fast and do it all in one day because we've been at this for two hours, right? It's only so much so much information that can fit in a rain in one sitting. So um, we need these things. Uh, we'll make a new 2D map. So I'm going to go ahead and click 2D node for the first one. And we want to use tile sets for something like that. They're all laid out on a grid, right? Nice and organized. So part of this one is looking at tile maps. So I'm going to open up Inkscape again and just create a couple tiles. The shapes we the shapes we use. So everything in everything is going to be basically the same number of pixels, right? Uh, square. I think the original one was 16 by 16, might have been 32 by 32. But some some nice square number. And then whenever Mario, the Mario and all the turtles and Goombas and block in the background, they all fill out the same amount of space. Then Mario will grow twice as tall, but he's the exact size of any two blocks tall. That's what I wanted you to uh Focus on some of that stuff. I'm just going to do some really quick images. Go to file, document, pro oops, not resources. File, document properties. Make sure you have something in pixels. You're displaying and measuring in pixels. Some size, 512 will work. And then we can draw like a character. I'm just going to grab a pen thing real quick. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but I want it to fill out the square here. Something like that. Maybe give it an arm. And then down here, a node. That's not very good. Let me try that again. Grab my pencil very quickly. Draw like a little face <clears throat> and a neck thing and a head. And then uh, very quickly draw the main part of the torso, and a couple legs, and an arm, and another arm. That'll work. That'll work for a character. Maybe change, could change the colors. I'm not going to worry about it so much on this one, but I am going to. This is the rough draft image, right? It's not the final draft. But I know I wanted to fill out the square that everything else is going to fill out nicely. So I just kind of stretch until it seems like it fills, fills that out or is all contained. Probably change colors, but for now, I'm going to go with the green character. Um, the very rough draft. Let's go file, save this somewhere. I'll go ahead and save it in the project. That, uh, Seems like a good place to save stuff. Um, and oh yeah, the one I just matched the keyboard on. And this will be the character. Um, file a new one. Background's gonna be a little bit different. Because background, I'm just gonna make a big blue square. Fill it out. Notice we can type the type the numbers in. I can come up here and type so it's exactly 512 by 512. It starts at 00. 
instead of dragging the mouse and trying to line it up perfectly. And this is the sky, so I'll just pick some blue color for the sky. Then I'm going to grab my pencil and draw a couple of white clouds. So I'll draw that, which needs to be a cloud, so I'll make it white or grayish. Whatever color I just clicked on. Then another one here. And maybe one more up here. I was going to fill those out. And then this one, I'll just stretch out the whole way. So the background's a little bit different, but notice it's really quick pictures. I'm not spending a lot of time refining this. Just click that and then go save it in the project. Um, new one. It's going to be a platformer. So this one I'm going to put a little bit more effort into. We can do just a solid bit, solid box, but I'm going to draw two boxes. And come up here, do one that's about half the size. Switch it so that it has a width of 512 and a height of 256. Starts at 00, zero which it's a little bit off. So I just select it, got our x and y coordinates, the height and the width. Then I'll do the other half is another box. So let's see. This is going to be the platform eventually, so I'll make that green. Then I'll do another box. I'll just draw it like that. And we're into that valuable part of SVG. I can just click on it and code it, basically. So x of 0, y of 256, um, width of 512, height of 256, and make this one like brown. So it starts to look like a platform. Let me grab the pencil. And I have snap turned on. Notice it, it wants to connect to that corner. And just draw something like this. Somewhere around halfway. And make that green. Um, then again, I'm going to come up here, make sure the numbers are right. So with that half selected, I want it to come halfway, which would be 256, right? Oh, wait, no. Uh, I'm going to start at that position. And then over here, width of 256. And the height's fine. But if I copy that, so Control C, Control V, and move this over uh, and there's a couple places to get to the option but we can basically flip it horizontally probably use these these buttons up here up at the top notice there's this triangle we hover over it flip it horizontally or flip it vertically in this case if we flip it horizontally and then set that at to start, 257 pixels over, the same number as this one, one let's make that 170 even. Typing those numbers in, we now have something that the left and right sides line up. So it'll look kind of like a platform. I guess I could adjust that middle there so that it doesn't look so funky, but something where the left and right sides line up. But you don't have to go that far for your project. Uh, for the homework assignment, you can just do a solid block there. Do a solid brown block and call it the ground and a blue background. And But with tiles, we want them to line up because we're playing things on the grid. So you want to, if you have time, if time allows, try to do some of that copy and paste. Maybe draw like a square and then um, flip it over horizontally and vertically. That way things line up when we put them next to each other. Get some practice with that because that one takes a little bit longer to do. Um, but as long as the like left side matches the right side, really that's all you need to write. Those five or 10 pixels right at the edge. If those line up, then we can lay these tiles next to each other. Same thing top and bottom. And depending on how you want them laying on the tile set. That's something you might want to get practice with. I'll save this as the ground over in that project again. 
So not looking for fancy artwork. I am at, I am looking for your artwork, but it doesn't have to be good artwork. Just put together some tiles and start getting some practice with that because that's a big component. And those three right there are probably enough to do it. We could make a duplicate of that one image. She called that the enemies of the game. Maybe give it a different color. Actually, I probably shouldn't make him the same color as the crown. Let me select everything and make it um, good. Oh, I missed one. <laughs> but when we use SVG graphics, we can do all that editing and stuff. It's kind of big, though. I'm thinking Mario, so I'm like 32 by 32 pixels is probably more reasonable. So if we go to File and Export, we can export it. We can see down at the bottom, it's going to export as a ping, which is a good size. But instead of 512, I want to make that uh, 32 by 32. It's probably a much better size for our thing. Then hit Export. And did that export? Yeah, so now we have the ping and the SVG. And well, we can see it from over and over it. The ping's 32 by 32, but the SVG is still huge so that it's easy to edit the details. And then the exported version is small and easy to work with. So you'll want to do, make sure you do that. File, uh, export. In this case, I'm going to re, I'm going to go ahead and export all those pings. But, the background I'll leave is 512 by 512, because so I'm going to stretch it out and change the size anyway. Um, and then on the third one, I'll export the tile, uh, ground tile, again, as 32 by 32, so that it fits in that same grid as our uh, not Mario. I should call it not Mario while we're talking about it. Mario is definitely a copyrighted thing. But it fits in the same same grid space as our not Mario to make that, that game alignment. And part of the reason we're doing this, like duplicating another game, it's this is a very important part of learning uh, a new game engine or learning game development the first time. When you do everything completely from scratch, like y'all are gonna do in your group projects. You can just change your you can change your design if you can't figure something out, right? But when you do that, which is what you're gonna do over and over and over again, when you're fully developing stuff, not learning the development, when you do that, you're free to skip things that you don't know how, don't know how to make. So you want to do a few things that are just duplicates of something else so that you you're stuck with that design. You can't skip a you can't skip a learning step because um, you want an easier way to do it or something. So it's important to uh, do some games like this. Um, now we can bring things in. So I could just like take this background thing. It's not going to be anything but the background. So if I drag it in here, I can just kind of stretch it out to the whole size of the screen or bigger. As long as the background is not smaller than the screen. On yours, it's probably going to be zoomed way out, right? And um, just grab that background image and stretch it out like that. But the background just kind of sits there in the back, back somewhere. And now to place those blocks in front of it. <laughs> um, we need a tile map. So I'm going to go back to the root node there, a new thing, and look, search for tile. And you should see tile map pop up. Planes or anything showed up in the hierarchy. And over at the right, it's asking for what tile set are we going to use? And notice the some stuff at the editor popped up down there. 
Um, if it's not behind Zoom buttons on your screen, you should see a new tab for tile mat. It's behind Zoom buttons, so I can't quite point at it. Am I directly below where my mouse is sitting? But if I try to move my mouse there, the Zoom buttons appear, and then the mouse doesn't move that direction anymore. Uh, so this is where we'll do tile set, create our patterns and drains, and um, a lot of nice stuff. I have a video for tile sets that I was going to send you, just sort of starting out here. And what I'm going to recommend is you take a few minutes, like half an hour or so, with these first couple steps we do here, click around, and then watch the video I'm going to send you that goes step by step. And that way, when they talk about stuff in the video, it won't be the very first time you've heard of that button, right? Look around and you'll see where the different buttons are, things like that. Uh, obviously, don't memorize them. It's like Microsoft Word. I assume everybody's used it. Has anybody ever bothered to memorize the buttons there? Probably not. Just have a, you've developed a pattern on how to look for the button you need. We want to do the same thing here. Even more accentuated here because we have way more buttons to look for. And the dynamic, the buttons are dynamic, they change on us. Um, so just like we saw a few times, right, when we put a mesh in earlier, shapes, the very top thing in the inspector was set to empty by default. If we click that, the only options are we have load or new tile set. Quick load is something that we've already. Uh, if we had like two tile maps in our game, if we already made a tile map, we could quick load it from this from this project, or load is just load the file in general from somewhere else, or we can make a new one. Obviously, we want a new one, and then once we choose that, when we click on it, we get the dynamic thing again, and uh, and. I guess I need to move the zoom box. Notice down at the bottom, we have two sets of tabs here. Then we have a tile set and a tile map. A tile set are the images we're going to use. <clears throat> this is where your spreadsheet goes. Um, so all these things. I'm dragging one over there. Now there's uh, the character pane. And Uh, and then click yes here. Do you want to automatically create tiles for this image? And uh, yes, we need tiles because we're gonna we're gonna use a tile map to lay this on the screen. Um, then we can do the ground. Drag it over. Uh, yes, yes. We want a tile of that. Actually, we didn't need the character, did we? I think I did something wrong with my PNG because my PNG is the whole thing instead of doing just what's in the square. Oh, so when you go to export, uh -huh. let's load it over. Uh, you want to go to page or selection, and then you can so then you can choose which one it is. So these tabs up here. Okay. Um, page gets what the, what's in that white square. Document gets everything. Selection then custom is uh, just. Choose a piece of it, like we could choose this little this little bot bit down here, instead of choosing that whole object. Okay, so now we have a tile, and notice up here, a little grid appears. That's our tile map, um, and you'll go back and forth between the tile set menu and the tile map. Obviously, the tile map is the one that we need in order to kind of paint our stuff on. So, we have our base tiles. Let me do that stuff later. Um, let me do this under tile set. Oh, yeah. So, under tile set, there's an option for paint. You can just choose whichever tile you want to paint on there. Oh, whoops. I just completely deselected the wrong thing. Um, Yours looks different than mine. Mine's like a much more zoomed in. But this? Yeah. 
Oh, what are you zooming in now? No, like my, mine has like is like yours is like a four by four. Mine is like a fifty by fifty. Yours is probably really big. Okay. Uh, so it's four by four because um, I had with tile map selected and the tile set expanded. Notice our tile size is 16 by 16. Uh -huh. I'm going to change that to 32 by 32 to match the tile. So now it should be a one by one tile. And. Um, okay, I see. Somewhere my tile is the wrong size. So under setup, I need to make this 32 by 32. Okay, now I got one tile, so I can just select that tile and choose the paint option. Paint what I want? I don't want paint. Select that tile, and notice how there's a bunch of options about it. We can animate the tiles, render the tiles. I'm sending you a video to start looking into this stuff. Create different properties, like we can give each tile physics properties. This is the ground, so we probably want physics properties on it. Um, under physics, over here under physics layers, add an element. Uh, I think I just need to add that. We'll talk about what these numbers mean here uh, soon. And under setup now, but not under setup. Under select, if we go to physics, uh, we can see this tile is part of physics layer zero. So it'll have collision layers and all of that stuff, velocity, and different things we can work in since that does kind of relate to what we were talking about. Kind of lost my place. Go to select, and and now we're ready to paint it. So when we go to tile map, we have this tile. We just select that. And notice we have a little pencil icon here. Select the pencil, and then select the tile. I've done that so many times. I always want to select the tile and then click the pencil. When we click the pencil, it deselects the tile. There's also a line, a rectangle, uh, but now we can just draw some platforms in. So I'll just start here, draw some platforms over there, some that our character would be able to jump to and notice how we just draw them on the map. But box by box on that tile, choose one, one at a time to put them in or click and drag, and just to do this much, just obviously to use the paint fill can, you have to have an enclosed shape. Once you get that, you can fill that in, and that's how you put it, that's how you'll put together the map for the world. Really, my plan was to talk about putting physics on the tile first. So the first thing is to build the map. Then we could just choose that other tile, right? The character. We go back to the tile set. And on the setup for that, it should be a 32 by 32 tile. That way we paint the whole thing. No properties on it. We don't have physics set up. Not adding any physics to this tile. Would you why, why would you do a tile for the character though? Um it's only had two pictures, was the one for this case. Okay. Um, but probably not for the character. Because, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be deleting that character tile in just a second. But since I only had two pictures, um, you can select the, pic the pencil and then that, and then you can just draw those tiles in. But, like, Brady just asked, why would you do it for the character? And you probably wouldn't unless you only had two. And notice, let me zoom in. If I click there, it erased that other tile. 
So you only have one tile per given spot in the map. And here's the eraser button. So I can just erase this. And this is really useful if you have lots of them. This icon, it's really small here, but see how that looks like the normal color picker? That's a tile picker. So now I can select that tile and do some painting with that one. Select that and go back to the pencil. Oh, whoops, I had the eraser selected. Deselect the eraser, where's another tile? I did see that instead of clicking the eraser, if you right click, it, that is eraser. Yes. So you can, without having to select the different tools. Multiple ways to do it. Um, I was mostly doing the eraser is very useful for this. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of hard to do with the right click? Um, yeah. Erase all of these at once. But that's how you lay out your tiles to start making your map. And then you set your character, then you create your character. This is probably what we would do with that other picture. I'll come up here. Um, it's just like we saw before. Let's add a um, character body 2D. And this character body needs a couple things, like um, a sprite. I mean, we create a sprite 2D as a child. And then the same thing we saw before with his character body. So we need the the shape for it, the logical body, the graphical body, which I can just drag that character being, oops. Select the sprite duty in the hierarchy. Then the character ping, I can just drag and drop in that spot. We don't, drag and drop works on all our menus. That's pretty standard across all of game engines. Uh, then we need the shape. Uh, so for the shape, add, a collision shape 2D, and our picture is a box, so probably makes sense just to put a box on there, right? I gotta get some buttons out of the way again. Zoom in where we can see it. Uh, switch the shape to just a rectangular shape, and grab the little handles till it fills out the character nicely. So there's our boundary for that. But when he starts falling down, he's going to hit the ground here. I'm probably moving over a little. Uh, I'll go to this. Oop. Go to this. Then click the move tools. I have little arrows. Move him so he's like actually on the scene. Now, when he falls down, he's going to hit the ground. But I think right now, he'll probably fall through it. Again, character body 2D, if we just attach a script, there's a default one that has those same things we just saw when we had 2D. So we have a jump option, and we have a left and right movement. I believe it's going to fall through the ground at this point. So one other thing to do. So that's what we saw before. So we know our character has a, a full shape. And our background is just a tile map. So there's a couple options. We could go through and set a very refined boundary on everything in particular. But we have this ground tile. And that tile for the ground Zoom buttons on my way again. I go to that and under the tile set, when I select it, we have all these different options. So on physics layer zero, um, the button, or am I just forgetting where it was? Make sure it's just your paint. So, um, if you go to paint, 
the way we're going to put it on there, then we have all these different things we can change about it when we paint it into our map. And once we add a physics, la physics layer element, so if there's nothing in physics layers, click add element and we can add several of those, but one should be enough for this game. Then you can choose that from this list. Okay. And um, when you first go in here, you'll see it look like this. So choose physics layer zero. Then click somewhere else. And here's our shape for that tile. Uh, notice how we have this. How did you do this to drag around? Okay, so um, on the tile set, yes. Select the tile you want to add to do. And with the tile set selected, tile map selected over here, if you go to the inspector under physics layers, make sure you add an element, make sure there's at least one element there. We'll talk about what those boxes mean. They're collision layers uh, and masking layers. All right. um, we'll talk about what those mean later, but make sure you see that. Then go to tile set, select the tile and go to the paint option. And at first, you're probably seeing this menu right here. Yeah, I'm in physics layer zero. In physics zero. Z index is like, Z index is positive out of the screen or into the screen, so in front of or behind. That's another one you'll often, you'll probably want to do some stuff with. But on physics layer zero, here's our shape. Here's our collision shape for that tile. So I'll move. Just to accentuate it, I'll move this down just a little bit. That way we're not at the complete top of the tile. And um, we should be able to see him stop at the right spot now. We still go right through it. Any thoughts as to why? So that's what this is. But uh, you're right on track there. We just added the collisions to the tiles. So now if I go paint a tile, I come back over to tile map, in the little pencil in that tile. Oh, turn off the eraser. With new tiles in there, they should have collisions. This time, unless I just messed something up. No, turn line just messed something up. No collision on the character. There should be. I have a collision shape. So it should detect it. I skipped something somewhere. Yeah, so uh, we have the collision there. I was in on the wrong map. Let me check out. Visibility, one one. <clears throat> I skipped a step somewhere, um, and I'm not sure which step I skipped. Tile set. So the tiles has physics. I'm just going to turn them on on every single layer. Oh, okay, that's the layers of that. I might have forgotten this one. Somewhere later there. Uh, 
Oh, there we go. I didn't apply it to the, I didn't, I forgot. We set up the boundary. Okay, so I just did a silly mistake that time. Let me undo this so you can see and go through the silly mistakes. Let me go like the tile map. It didn't update the existing tiles. So, yes, this was selected when we did that. It did update the existing tiles. I can't deselect this now. This one was not selected, so I set the collision boundary in front of a blank background. Click on the tile, and now see how now see how that collision boundary applies to that tile. Um, before the background was just blank here, mm -hmm. so make sure the tile is in the background. Sorry, that was a silly mistake on my part. Now they should update. And we have a character thing, so the left and right and jump work. How easy it is to make a platform, you know, right? It's not a fine product. There you make that jump. So, uh, not a final product, but we can get something going really, really quick. So, should have some time to start doing that. That's kind of what I'm expecting on the final group project, too. Obviously, bigger than the weekly assignment. I think I think it would be fairly small. If it starts to look like it's going to be something massive, like you get really, really stuck and it's taking forever, I'm expecting it to take a few hours, obviously. That's why it's a two-week assignment. It's like I'm expecting you all to start on this today and work on it for an hour or so every day, and, and then the due date's going to roll around. So it's not going to be a quick assignment. Make sure you well do what I just said. Start on it today and work on it for an hour or two every day. Otherwise, you're looking at about 12 hours of work. That's why it's a, that's why it's a two week assignment. Uh, plus, you're adding the learning time, so um, give yourself plenty of time to do it. But that'll start on the assignment. Any questions about those? Laying out the tile sets. Sorry about that mistake. Let's go over that again. So you go to the tile set tab, and we can go to paint and choose the physics layers. Actually, I can do it on this one. So I'll choose that other tile that we're not really using. So when I go to paint uh, and choose the physics layer zero again, notice how the collision area there is still on the other tile. So make sure you click the tile you want to edit. I forgot to do that part. Make sure you see the right thing in the background. You should also see it in the preview over here. And then we go to the tile map. You just paint them on there. Um, you can make the tiles move. I wasn't really going to expect. I was going to expect you to make little game objects that kind of walk back and forth on their own. But you could, you could include. Um, it's not Mario, so the things that would be in the spot where the Goombas and Turtles are, those could be put in your tile map. Your mobs could be put in your tile map. And your character is an object separate. That's a little more complicated. I'm not really expecting you to do that, but it, um, but it lets you know that that's possible to answer a question that kind of showed up earlier. We would want the character in the tile map there if we're going to animate it and make it start doing stuff. But most people would probably make it an object. It might be good on the original Mario because that's how the Goombas and Turtles were set in the original Mario Brothers. They were in, they were animated in the tile. They were in the tile map, and each one had their own script. Because so all they do is walk left or right until they bounce in, hit something, and then they walk the other way. They don't have, they didn't have a complicated script. All right. So you mean? Uh have a separate tile map that has the enemies and and then it goes through that tile map and finds where the enemy is and then place an object right there. That would work. You can try it. If you haven't done that before you uh I, I don't since know you've done I, some game dope so most people just make it their own make it an object. It makes more sense. But it, it can be done that way. Lots and lots of things can be done. You want to give yourself time, try different things. I usually say three. 
try three times. If you can't figure it out, if you can't, guess it. Or take what you're, obviously, the first couple steps you're going to have to look up. But after you've seen things a few times, take a couple guesses, see if you can figure out a way to make it happen, but don't waste all day taking guesses. I would say, can't get it in three guesses, then, um, uh, then look it up. And also, help menus are built in here, so you can go to the script. Your functions in the script, like action just pressed, and the editor here, if you hit control and click on it, that will open the documentation here. It's a really, really useful feature while you're learning that. Um, the other thing uh, that's coming up due soon, or the first steps are due soon, go to Ivy Learning. We do have three projects coming up. As, Anybody reached out, started communicating with the group members yet? Okay, I, that's what I was going to ask for today. Like, I'm getting ready to drive to Indianapolis. Um, so, and I was going to say, put a little thing on here uh, where you can submit. It'll go towards attendance and participation points, basically. But maybe by the time we get to Indianapolis, uh, let me know how your group is communicating. Discord or Facebook messenger. Okay. Lots and lots of ways we can communicate with each other. I guess it's funny. It looks off that one. I haven't done that one to random draw yet, but that's the truth. Yeah. There are lots of ways we can meet, communicate in our modern world. Yeah. Zoom accounts. Uh, Ivy Tech got Zoom accounts for all of us. So uh, figure out how you're going to communicate today with your group and let me know that. Um, we're like pretty quick, like today. Maybe just an email. Would an email work better for that? Every group send me an email and let me know which what you talked to or if you couldn't couldn't get a hold of somebody. And that way we know that they they are starting. And then is it this week? Is it this week? Yes, you learned them. Okay, yeah. So, um, whoops, whoops, not there. Not a great book. Wrong book. Pod rolls. I, uh. No problem with information in the pod rolls. So. <laughs> There's not any, not many grades in there anyway yet. I think the only grades that hopefully I can show there. We need to add the load type in the first level. Um, for your game? For the project? Yeah. Um, Does it count? Most of most of what's gonna be the most of what's gonna be due next Monday. Uh, it's pretty if I remember I'm pretty sure the stuff for the group is just the proposal of what we're doing and yeah, what you're doing and then um the project management tools on GitHub. I was gonna point at those real quick, but I meant to be finished like ten minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> um yeah, so basically you're gonna do this and and the additional thing is just to make sure you're all getting started. Like sometime today, let's say before you go to bed tonight. Uh, try to get it to me before I get to Indianapolis. Uh, what, a two hour drive, or an hour and a half drive, but that'll put me at Indianapolis right at rush hour. So that probably extends it to another half hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, but, and, to our drive, I'd like to see an email that says I talked to the group members. We're going to talk on Discord. Most people, most groups seem to like Discord. It's a great way to communicate. Or we're just going to use the Ivy Learn message feature or whatever. But send me a message to let me know what your group's going to do and then what project you're going to make and then project management tools. Software development is sort of a project management role, if you all haven't noticed. That's the reason you all have to take two project management courses. Not one like other ID people. The coder is the one that would write in the script that there's an array in line 50 or something. The software developer is the one that would make the decision there needs to be an array at line 50. Just to clarify what we're studying here, right? Obviously, the developer can be coder, but as layers go, um, the project manager tells the software developer to do something. So middle management, that's the word for it. Software developers are middle manager. You got the project manager, the client, working with the client. They tell the software developer the big picture uh, and more generalized picture of what needs done. 
breaking them down into pieces and the software developers like the middle manager telling the coders what needs to be done for the project. Um, GitHub has some great project management tools in here. So this is what I was going to ask you all to do. Um, I don't think I have anything. Um, I'll go to the one from the Python class last week. So go to the project side. Projects can be connected to multiple repositories. That goes with um, that goes with your account, but you have the tab for projects in every single repository. Like obviously, you're going to upload your code to GitHub. Hopefully, somebody in the group knows that. If anybody in your group doesn't know, has never worked with GitHub before, make sure you put that in the email for today. Go to the projects tab. The default on the button is linked to an existing project. So in this case, you're going to want to create a new project. One person in the group is going to have to set up the repository, and then it'll be, and then add the rest of the group to that project and create a new project. And the same way you'll share this, once you create the project, you'll just add the other members to it. Um, you can create things from scratch. There's uh, tables, which are kind of like spreadsheets. A board is like a Kanban board. Kanban means white card. That's the Japanese index card. They'd have a bulletin board or a basket full of things that needed done. And whenever a programmer would finish something, they would go over to the basket, grab the next one out of the basket, and put it on the tag it to the bulletin board saying they're working on it and move it back and forth in different columns if things got stuck along the way. It was great in Japan. Do that in Japanese culture, you get the like ultimate model of um, cooperation and optimization. But the idea worked really well. It doesn't work so well in American culture because Americans are going to pick and choose between the cards. Yeah, these are very really trying good. to figure out which one, which card to grab. Uh, so cultural differences, but it's still a useful tool. Or we can build roadmaps, which is what get decided to call the Gantt charts. That's the calendar-like ones. So from uh, you know, from Friday to Monday, we work on the project proposal. Uh, I, Friday and Saturday, come up with the idea. Saturday and Sunday, rough draft of the proposal. Monday, do the final draft of the proposal. And you break it out and chart it out that way. Or they have um, some templates. If you go to templates, that's probably the easiest way. Feature templates, team planning is a really nice one. It has a bunch of those already customized. I was creating a new project. So here's a Kanban board and an item. Uh, project proposal. So there's the first item, right? Uh, it's the to-do thing. And then hopefully before long, you'll move it over to the in progress. And then you'll move it over to the, and when that's in progress, uh, another thing to do is a uh, final edits on proposal. We're just gonna sit there in the to-do list until somebody on your team gets this over in the done project. Like, okay, that's done. Then somebody else can come through, move those in, and it's over. So we, you can keep track of what everybody on the team's doing based off the card. And color coding, um, that's pretty standard. I'll go ahead and say it. Most people don't need that one explicitly stated, but typically everybody on the team gets their own color, and then you can tell exactly what color, what team member's doing what. Team capacity, notice the little thing from the Kanban board already showed up over here. This, this is the table. It's like a giant spreadsheet. Uh, current iteration. Um, I did it on the bug report, the backlog, versus the current iteration. We have a couple of boards. Where's the most appropriate one? Roadmap is the uh, when we start things. So we need a date fields. And we'll have a start date and an end date. You have to put the end dates in there somewhere. So I'm saying this is going to go from April 3rd to, um, oh, whoops, start date. Where's the end date set? Let's do it over here. Drag that a little bit short. Because I'm not getting short. Um, 
Alright, start date. End date. I have no idea where the end date is. Well, I'll just click on this. Um, it's going to start on April 3rd, which is start date. Oh, there's the end. Uh, end date of the 8th. That's the due date. Actually, we probably don't need that long for one. Start on the 3rd, end that by the 5th. Date. Oh, I know. I can add some more dates in there. So, um, but there is a black line for it not next to the eighth. So maybe the the looks of the banner is just way too long. I don't know. Yeah. Um, is that size thing maybe where you? Or, um, I'm trying to remember where the uh, there's an add date thing somewhere, and I don't see the add the date button. Right click. Okay. No longer has the end date on. Yeah, I erased the end date. Uh, but then we do other things. So, like this one, you can probably just type it in manually. Instead of starting on the third, start on the fifth, and then end this one on the seventh. Yeah. And we get a little chart. It starts to look like this. So, April 3rd to 5th. I don't know why it's not making it shorter. I'm not sure what you're set up. Uh, oh, because the end date is set to the 16th, apparently. Generation in 16th. Right. It says iteration in. Like, like when you're hovering over it, it that's just. Oh, oh, okay. It's the iteration end date. Where do I change the iteration dates? Current iteration, probably on here somewhere. Do that drop down arrow. Are you wanting to change one iteration date? Yes. Huh. Did you see something? So this is what you will click around with, but these sort of this one's especially not intuitive. The cards are fairly easy to work with. Try to get those in there. And it should be under project settings, I guess. Um, the settings or close settings. Under project settings, there's iteration. So iteration one should be the third through the eighth. Or third through fifth. I'll do it that way. Um, then iteration two will be the seventh through the eighth. So I'll kind of settings that way. I don't think there's a oh there's a button. Then uh, you can see that got a little bit shorter. So it runs through the current iteration. And then the other one starts on the second iteration, which the dates didn't seem to update. We don't want to click around there with your group partners on the discussion. Make sure you go to settings and adjust all of those things. 
set your dates in there or adjust your start date and end date. Um, you can add multiple dates, midpoint, I'll call it that, as a date. And um, then edit what that what that date's gonna be. Once we add that midpoint, go back. And when we choose our date fields, we can just set everything on a particular date. So then this one starts on the third, ends on the midpoint date. Still gonna make the picture shorter. This one's not very intuitive, but click around on that on your group. The big one I'm gonna be looking at is the Kanban boards. Uh, give me your group, talk about those, and think about what game you're going to make. And yeah, the point of that is just to get familiar with those controls. And you can see they are, the ones on GitHub are very non-intuitive, but they're very useful because we're probably gonna keep our project on GitHub anyway. Um, so one example of the tools. What exactly are we emailing to you? Like just the link to the GitHub or? Oh, uh, that gets submitted like next week. So today, just email me that, uh, let me know you've talked to your group and how your primary communication is going to be. And then let me know if things are going well or if maybe you couldn't hear from anybody. It's like I've reached out to my group tried two or three times and I haven't heard from anybody. Let, let me know what's going on with that. And I will, uh, in particular, if you can't get a hold of your group, that's the ones I'm most worried about. Because if, uh, if you can't get a hold of your group, any anybody else in your group, we um, should probably address that sooner rather than later. So that's all that needs to be in the email. Just let me know that you talked to your group or tried to talk to your group and couldn't whether things are starting out, whether it seems you've taken the first steps or not. And then the first steps get submitted next Monday for the homework assignment. Anybody have any questions about that? Probably lots of questions, right? Those GitHub tools are not, in, they're not at all intuitive. Uh, there are other project management tools. Trello. I don't like the this one. settings in this better than Trello. Unless you want to shell up money. I'm sure that if you actually paid for a Trello account, it's great. Yeah, but you, you, you don't get very much from Trello on the free account. I mean, but... Uh, I don't know. It seems limited. Yeah, the Kanban's free. Yeah. Well, the Kanban's free, but it's not as easy to change and manipulate stuff. No, you just get the one I get. Yeah, yeah, I like the Kanban more like uh, the, the Ant chart. That's what that is. That's a... Yeah. The a game chart, which is what Monday.com is, that one that I was picking around and just like, this is not intuitive. I've used it a number of times, still have to look for buttons, still get lost. That's a Gantt chart. Um, you've probably seen ads for Monday.com, but Monday.com is game chart. I mean, have you? So the nice ones look like this. So we have the calendar along the top. Like all of these people are going to work on these steps. And after they're done, then, they, then these people can get started in it. That's what the roadmap one is for. Um, so I'm not opposed to using other ones, but make sure you run it by your group. Oh, how to find works in the group? Who's in the group? Should have done that. So if you go to the people tab and I've learned, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. I'm just right now. I'm gonna do it I don't even know if those are Um, what is the inbox? So, so this is sometimes the easiest way. Like, if you go to the inbox, and when you create a new message, um, go over down for our class, and then here where you select names, teacher students, you can just select the group. So you can choose 
the members of your group. I don't know which one you're in. Oh, one of the things was another name too. I said, pick a cool name for your group. Think of it, think of game development companies. So like when you choose one group, you can see all your group members. Um, or if you go to our course, That was great. Yeah, and I knew what Charles' group was doing because you were doing it in the classroom the other day. Yeah. <laughs> um, under the people tab, and yeah. there's a tab for project groups. Uh, you'll just look for your name in that group. Any other questions? I should keep that open this time in case somebody has questions. Okay, I was planning on finishing about half an hour ago. That's a long class. So I'm really glad we didn't cancel the class because it wasn't necessarily a short class the other day either. It's a lot of information to cover here. <laughs> Which leaves uh, an hour of, roughly about an hour of lab time to do stuff. Start clicking around. <laughs> we And we barely have time to scratch the surface of it. <laughs> um, Start clicking around on the tile set, and it'll probably be tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening, sometime tomorrow. I'm going to send you a video. I really want to go to the, new, the top of my editor and get up. Be careful to just go searching for those videos because they just did a major overhaul to that. So if you just randomly search, the algorithm's going to return the one videos that have the most views which are obviously going to be the only tile editor uh, up to 4.1. Oh, so literally just did it. Literally just did it. Just redid it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you're going to see the ones up. You're going to... Because we are only on 4.2. Yes. Oh, three, the one in 3.0, and then they made some bigger changes, and then they, then they did more changes. So... Um, yeah, basically, you make sure you put 4.2 in the search bar. But it's one of those things that if you just search for tile, tile maps, and you know, you're going to find the old ones. Because they've changed it repeatedly over the years. The, the latest changes, though, was they wanted to be in line with you. It, uh, so they started to do one thing, they started to do their own thing again, and then when Unity ran off all their users, they were like, oh wait, we should probably do what Unity's tile editor was like. Now we've got all these ex-Unity people here to help us, let's just have them do their thing. <laughs> yes, last year they ran off the people that used Unity, but the year before, Unity ran off the people that worked for Unity, like the coders that made the engine, and they all went to get open source projects, that's why Godot came along. Was so much happened in Gado the year before Unity alienated all the them. That's why you don't tick off your pro your programmers. They'll yeah. yeah. run off and be like, "Hey, you, you're good now." <laughs> but but what's it matter? Unity is a data collection company. They collect data for advertising firms. So what do they care if it's a, if it's a game engine or if they have to do a different method? They're still going to be able to collect data for the game engine. Their their business is not interrupted by losing the game people. So for drawing the tree, are we allowed to import the add curve? Um, uh, not on the, not on the <laughs> quiz, actually draw a quiz. The rest of, after that, after that, after that quiz, the rest of the semester, we'll use like the, that landscape button. We'll use the insert tree but button. I, I could make a really good tree with that. But yeah. Well, the draw a stick with the hat. Yeah, yeah. The, there's an insert tree button, just like that insert landscape button. We can also insert house buttons, insert buildings. We can build cities. We can insert cities. Actually, getting up to an entire city is a little complicated. That's not interactive to Blender, but there's a lot, a lot of nice features there. But we can insert trees and houses just as easy as that. <laughs> All right. It's been a moment since I asked if there were any questions. I assume no questions mean no. The silence means there's not any. If you have any, let me know. For the next couple of days, I'm going to be in um, Westfield. Uh, so uh, in meetings all day long, basically around the clock. All the IT faculty from all across Indiana meet in Indianapolis every year. That's what it is. So 
basically like round the clock meetings so that we get things done instead of uh, unproductive Zoom calls. It's way more productive than all the Zoom calls. So you're not going to the French Lick? That's next week. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, Westfield, Indian, uh, North Indianapolis today. So um, I might be a little slower than normal responding to messages, but I will I will still be checking them every chance I get. So it won't take me long to get back to them. Otherwise, y'all have a great weekend. And on Monday, we will be virtual. And on Wednesday, we'll have a short class session. Uh, like, I have to leave. I'll be leaving at 2.30. So uh, I have to in class, then go grab my suitcase and load it into one of the school's vehicles by 2.30. So it's going to be a very short session on next Wednesday. We're going more like 2.15 or 2 or something like that. Yeah. So like, mm -hmm. like, an hour, like an hour, but I don't want to lose that hour. Okay. Y'all seen how long uh, it takes a while to cover game development. If you have any questions, though, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you all next week. Everybody have a great weekend. Really? I'm not sure. Uh...